Six Music. This is a BBC Radio Six Music documentary. Baby, don't you hear the wind howling? Howling all around you. I played harbor guitar. Baby, don't you hear the wind howling? Right from the east south end, from Arkansas side back to the Alabama side. I know both sides. And then straight down, I know Mississippi, clean down the Louisiana line. Lord, it ain't gonna howl no more. David Honeyboy Edwards was an early blues man. Hopping freight trains, always looking for a porch or street corner, a house party, juke joint or bootlegger's house where he could play his own raw and unfiltered Mississippi blues. The best way to ride if you want to go a long way is Hoboy and if you can, get in a car box. I'd ride freight trains and I'd come to Cairo, Illinois. They call that the Mason Dixie Line. Right at Missouri and Illinois. And I'd go in the yard, I'd get off the train. That's first that train, that freight comes. So you got to make up and get another freight coming to Chicago. Lord, I'm going to Chicago. Just to get my hand on board. Honey Boy hoboed with the best of them. Lord, I'm going to Chicago. Playing alongside or watching and learning directly from the musicians who were the source of the blues. Well, I get up in the morning. Get your high with 49. Big Joe Williams, Charlie Patton, Tommy Johnson, and Sun House. Along with the rails that he rode, he had a steel track memory that's kept those early blues men alive. He could vividly recall his fellow musicians and their music right up until he died last year, age 96. Number 12 out of station. Number two way out on the road. From a poor sharecropping family, he'd live on to win two Grammys and the National Heritage Fellowship, America's most prestigious folk honor. But Honey Boy remained a hobo. Sometime I wonder till the day he drew his last breath. I didn't my woman go. Every morning. I've traveled Kentucky some, but not too much. With Mississippi and Arkansas and Alabama, Louisiana, Texas. I've been all over them states here about. Honey Boy was one of the hundreds of thousands of young men hoboing through the 30s and 40s depression, the last financial crash that uprooted and devastated America. They moved where the harvest took them, cereals on the Midwestern plains, apples in Washington, strawberries in Louisiana, all the fruit in California and beet in North Dakota. Baby. Film director Michael Lace made the documentary Riding the Rails. There were estimates of four million people on the road at the height of the Great Depression. Our film concentrated on the kids. There were at least 250,000 kids riding the rails at the height of the Great Depression. The term hobo is an abbreviation for the expression hoboy, which after the Civil War, when there were a lot of unemployed soldiers in America. They were looking for farm work and essentially your implement was a hoe. I got no run, got no special kid. And you could imagine these kids on trains, there would be trains covered with people, one going east, the other going west, both looking for work, knowing there was none where they'd come from. They were passing each other in opposite directions. I'm trained up John, I hate to see you go. I never had nothing, nothing to hurt me so. For Honey Boy, the journeys took him from the plantations to the levee camps, especially on the weekends. He'd roll off a train and supply good time music to the just got paid workers. Playing music meant he could avoid the hard sweat of field work in Mississippi. Lord, if you can't roll, get your bridges down. I'd go to the camp, play my guitar, make a stack, 
Sunday morning, I lead up with a pocket money. I ain't staying until Monday because they're going to work money and I ain't going to work. Guy Davis, blues musician and entertainer, recently played at festivals with Honey Boy. When I think of the Mississippi blues, I think of some huge work machine made up of human beings going across the field, mowing down acres and acres of grass or cotton just by a repetitive motion. That is where the blues songs got their meaning from, their guts from, was doing that. So you could be out there for those damn 12 hours or whatever it is, you had to work from sunup to sundown. This is backbreaking work. So those men, it was like being hypnotized with those old songs. I believe that that is what Honey Boy would have heard in his youth. The people singing, the guitar players that followed it. So how much of it came out of the church too? The guitar with the blues man is almost like the church. The blues man is the preacher and the guitar is the congregation. So he just says something and then the guitar answers him. And that goes according to his sense of time. And it might have 13 bars instead of 12. Or it might have 16 bars, who knows? That's up to him. That's that solo blues man playing the blues. Like the Robert Johnsons and the Sunhouses. One man, one guitar singing. And that guitar was his congregation. I woke up this morning. If you hear the walking blues, I'm told that that was an axe chopping song. It's a shoo, woke up this morning. I was shoo, feeling brown for my shoes. Well, shoo, you could tell I had made them a shoo, oh, walking blues. Oh, whoa, shoo. Let me, let me grab this guitar a second. I'm gonna get up in the morning. I believe I'll dust my room. Here's a congregation. I'm gonna wake up in the morning. I believe I'll dust. Here's the answer. been loving honey you and him could have my room there's certain standard kinds of things that are used in the blues that just all have to do with call and response and just you got your whole church right there in your lap and it's shaped like a guitar with strings on it that's robert johnson's walking blues honey boy played with robert johnson refining his sound from him and others he met along the road I got the key. Cause I know Earl Robert, cause he used to go with my cousin Willie Mae Powell's and she used to tell me about him all the time, but I hadn't met him. When I met him it was 1937 on the streets in Greenwood, Mississippi. Then we got acquainted with each other. Then we was gigging around together. I left that year and went to New Orleans in the winter time. And I come back in March in 38, the same year he died. And we hooked back up again. And I was staying with Robert Clean until he died. Robert died in 1938. Honey Boy was there when Robert Johnson was poisoned, but it was the other Johnson that impressed him the most. Blues musician Dave Peabody toured with Honey Boy in the UK. One of his favorite bluesmen of all was Tommy Johnson. He said when it came to it, nobody could really touch Tommy. And we've got a very small recorded legacy of Tommy Johnson. And I asked Honey Boy about Robert Johnson, and he just thought, no, he was okay. But nothing special at the time compared with Robert Petway, who was another one of his favorites, and especially Tommy. He just seemed to idolize Tommy Johnson. While learning the guitar as a teenager, Honey Boy heard Tommy Johnson play on the cotton plantations where he lived and worked. He was transfixed by Johnson's intricate chord voicings and eerie, haunting falsetto, as well as his showboating and ability to work up a crowd. When Honey Boy became a rambling musician, he'd often visit Tommy Johnson for nights of drinking and music. 
when I first knew Tomey, oh, I was young, and then I, after I started playing music, I went down to Jackson. He's from Jackson, Mississippi. When I go down to Jackson, Jackson about a hundred miles from Greenwood. I go down to Tomey, and we sit around and drink cane. He play the blues, and he's a lady. Something she never would wake to play guitar. Michael Frank, founder of Earwig Records, was Honey Boy's manager and harmonica player for over 30 years. Well, my mama told me. He was born in the middle of the Mississippi Delta to sharecropping parents before the Depression. And he was born in 1915. He saw the high point of King Cotton and the lowest point. Well, my mama told me. The South was rural. Cotton really was king, and most of the southern economy, certainly in Mississippi and Arkansas, parts of Missouri, cotton was the engine that drove everything else. So there were these huge plantations, which we call farms now, and the labor was, for the most part, poor black people who were actually living on the plantations. If you go to Mississippi now, you will very rarely see an old house out in the field. In Honey Boy's youth, plantations had houses scattered all across the field. In Honey Boy's autobiography, he recalls that he was working in the fields by the time he was nine. Running a plow behind the mule to drag the grass out of the middles were the words he used. Tell me, what's the this was the poorest of the poor, and it was mostly black folks. Sharecropping meant you had a certain amount of freedom, and in theory, the harder you worked, the quicker you could pay off a debt to the plantation owner. In theory, at least. Captain a ten pound mold is too small. But by most accounts, it was relentless. Michael Ace. If you look at Honey Boy Edwards, Mississippi, what he's growing up with, he's basically growing up with sharecrop slavery. That's what they're looking at. It's not slavery, but you're bound to the landlord. You're paying the landlord. Sometimes you're paying the landlord more than you're making. You can essentially buy yourself out of sharecrop slavery because you're a tenant. If you can pay the landlord enough, you can get out of it. But it's really another form of slavery. You're renting land, and if you didn't produce enough, you might owe more money than you're actually making. You could get yourself in debt. Well, John Henry's counting told him. When I first started trying to play the guitar, I was 14 years old, I was 29, I first started, but I was on my own then. We lived on the plantation, and the man had a guitar, and he kept it a year, and he got tired of it, and my father bought it for me. When I went to Honey Boy's apartment on Chicago's south side, he was 92 years old. The night before, He'd been playing with a young band, drinking beers and ogling at the ladies, and still looking to have a good time. Not much had changed since he was a young teen in Mississippi, where after learning some guitar basics from his father, he was called in to play for the neighbors across the field. Honey Boy was plied with alcohol throughout the course of the evening at 14, so that he could keep playing music for these people that were partying all night, and he said, he kind of got a kick out of it because when he would start to doze off, they'd give him another drink and he'd sort of perk up for a quick minute. And he said he started to get a little taste, started to like alcohol after that, hard liquor. I was standing on the corner just as drunk as I could be. And some pretty girl said, you the one me. Just imagine one young man armed with nothing but an acoustic guitar against a horde of boozed up and rowdy folks who just got paid and wanted to party. That's a lot of room to fill. I put it to Guy Davis. Well, I love you, baby, can I? Do you think the guitar, in a way, was the whole orchestra? Yes. Man, you hit the nail on the head. The guitar was absolutely the orchestra. If they're sitting in a chair at a juke joint and the, let's see, 
the floor that becomes the drum. You got your legs stomping on the floor. You sure see Honey Boy doing that, just like they say Robert Johnson did. The guitar itself, if you can hit some treble strings, then you've got a melody. And if you can hit the bass strings, you've got the bass. And if you fancy like Blind Blake, you can play the middle strings too. You can play the, the middle, the upper, the low. So yeah, you've got an orchestra and you've got a voice to communicate just what the song means. Yeah, yeah. I wonder then if one of the hallmarks of the Mississippi blues is the driving bass string. In my opinion, yes, it is. One of the hallmarks of the Mississippi blues is the bass strings. There's stuff I heard Honey Boy do or that you hear it likely hear or Lightning Hopkins or John Lee Hooker when you hear that. If I was a catfish swimming at all deep blue sea all these women now and I'm fishing after me Fishing after me Fishing after me Fishing after me He did, yeah, he would do this thing too like uh, Charlie Patton did So he's got percussion, he's got everything going on with the guitar Imagine doing a song at some point and there's a woman who's waiting to just shake her hips just a certain way when she hears that. The guitar is meant to have fun with, and I know Honey Boy was the kind of person to do just that. If he was borrowing somebody else's riffs, it didn't matter that he didn't invent the riff. The idea is that he got to play it and have fun with it and get off of working in the field with it and have some girlfriends with it. And the bass will do that, man, if you do it just right. <laughs> A lot of blues on record are sad. They have that intimate power that comes across on some of the great recordings. But that's not what they played to the folks who wanted to party and dance. You had to have a big repertoire. And most of the music was for dancing. There's so much variety to blues. I get a bit annoyed when people just try and categorise it as you know, moaning old music and really sad. No, it's not. It's powerful, you know. It's like Shakespeare. Shakespeare runs the whole gamut of emotions. So does the blues. Feel so good. Feel so good today. Honey Boy was an instinctive musician. He left school when he was young, if he ever actually turned up for class at all. Well, my baby left town and you left town and I'm the state. For him, being able to hobo and hustle as a musician was the only way out of the fields. Though Dave Peabody reckoned he had learned to read at some point. A lot of people thought that Honey Boy couldn't read or write. He usually stayed with me when he was in London. He was at my flat and it was a rainy day and we had nothing to do. So I left him a pile of blues magazines to look at the pictures, I thought. And I looked in after a while to see how it was going on. And he was actually moving his finger and reading very slowly. And he was reading an article on the Mississippi flood of 1927. I said, I was there, I was there, you know, so I thought, he can read. I'm thinking of the Piedmont blues and Blind Blake. You know, it's very pretty, it's quite refined. And then you get to Mississippi and it's sort of loud and ugly and stripped down, really bare knuckle, isn't it almost? It's raw. Now this is something that made me grow, these Mississippi blues. I came up doing the East Coast blues, the Piedmont style, because I had a facility for fancy finger picking and that was good, but I was very interested in hiding behind it kind of hiding my voice. I didn't know. The Mississippi blues was so raw. It was like scary, it was powerful, it was hideous, it was all these things. It was uncontrolled energy to me. And Howlin' Wolf, I didn't have a place to put him in my psyche. Smokestack Lightning, where the hell is this coming from? This man, wow. I mean, it's powerful, but I didn't have it connected to me yet. And I got a chance years ago to play the part of Robert Johnson on stage. I was offered this role, but when I came into it, I knew deep down that, man, my only expertise on the slide had to do more with Blind Willie McTell, with that finger-picky East Coast style. And so I had to really get down in myself and open up a whole area of myself that I didn't know. I had to improve myself as a musician 
and open myself as a singer in order to accomplish this. And it taught me so much. I got After Honey Boy's mother died, the family moved to Greenwood to the Wildwood Plantation. Honey Boy worked with his father on what remained of the cotton crops. Mark Wyman is the author of Hobo's Bindle Stiffs, Fruit Traps and the Harvesting of the West. This is the period when the banks crashed. It was preceded in the late 20s by a farm depression over much of the country. And people would line up to get their money out of the banks, and then the banks would crash. My parents lost their savings in 1931. And I asked my dad how much. He said, well, $300. He said it wasn't much, but it was all we had. And that happened over and over. There was really no safety net in the 30s. So when you had a society that was no longer heavily agricultural, but more and more urban, there wasn't much to do, and the FDR programs and the New Deal took a few years to kick in with the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC, that offered jobs to a lot of young men and all over in state parks and national parks and forests, things like that. So for the early 30s, especially up to the mid-30s, it's really kind of bleak. Honey Boy's ticket out of this came in the form of a charismatic, wild, brash and brilliant bluesman, none other than Big Joe Williams. That was 32. And Joe Wheaton come through the country, playing the guitar. One Saturday night, I went over to the dance while he was playing. He was playing. I had never heard a man play guitar like that before. I believe I just my bed. I just kept looking at him, and he looked at me. He said, what you looking at? He said, can you play? I said, I can play a little bit. He said, I'll take my guitar and hit it now. And I hit a tune on for him. And he said, I can learn you how to play. It's like that. Well, I stuck with him that night because I wanted to learn how to play. I stayed all night there with him at the dance. Sunday morning, we went to my house to eat breakfast, played guitar around for my father and my sister and them. He asked my dad, he said, Mr. Henry, said, can Honey go with me? He said, I learned how to play the guitar. He was in the winter time. He said, I don't care where Honey go now. I said, we can't work on the farm and nothing like that now. I said, it's bad out. I said, he can go if he want to. If anyone knew how to pound out tunes and entertain a rowdy crowd by himself, it would have been Big Joe Williams. Like the man himself, there was nothing subtle about his playing. It was loud, rough and funky, and it could make you dance. Big Joe, who was a very rough character, heavy, heavy drinker, rough on it, illiterate, but knew how to get around and knew how to hustle, playing music on the streets or gambling or whatever. Big Joe taught him a lot about that. They went into town in Greenwood from the plantation and hung around Greenwood, Mississippi, then ended up all the way down in New Orleans, living near the French Quarter, playing on the streets in little joints. When I first started traveling, traveling, uh, I took the devil of man to be my home. So during that time, Honey Boy learned more about how to hop freights, how to hustle on the street for tips, how to really make a living on his own. Well, you know my little woman, she gone and left me. All I can do is hang my head and moan. Riding the boxcars of freight trains, or car boxes as Honey Boy called them, was the way to travel for free. Honey Boy and Big Joe Williams rode among the thousands of hobos looking for work during the Great Depression. And the pressure really stayed on till 40 and about 10 years, damn right. The Depression lasted up until World War II. Hoover was replaced by Roosevelt, but the Depression went on and on and on and on. And on and on the moving trains, desperate and gaunt people jumped 
climbing in under or onto the roofs of moving boxcars just to find the way out of their hunger and for a shot at some sort of future. All the thing about it is dangerous about the train running so fast sometimes the rocks might hit you or something like that yeah. by picking up something. These freight trains are not built to carry humans. They're dirty, smoky, I mean, they're not air conditioned. You could also be in 100 degree heat. You could be burning away in the desert. You could run out of water. You could freeze to death. You were just out in the elements. There was nothing to protect you. I hang around here in the bushes, in the shade trees in the summertime. When the train hook up and everything, I see the brakeman, he throw the line up. He had a line on him. And that'll get easier to signal. They're getting ready to go. All aboard! All aboard! The hobos, as they developed in the late 19th century, really wanted to be kept separate from the tramps. Chicago had a hobo college in the 20s, and the head of that said that the hobo works and wanders, the tramp dreams and wanders, the bum drinks and wanders. And hobos were often angry that they were somehow linked with tramps. But the truth is, you couldn't tell the difference if you saw them in a boxcar on a railroad or saw them walking down the street. Honeyboy was still keen to share some insider tips about riding the rails when I spoke to him. Riding the blind is riding the passenger train. You ride a passenger train where you're supposed to pay, but you don't pay. You go around to the baggage car where to keep the mail in, and that's the blind. Old John saw train coming and it just Oh, oh the mail train is the blind? Mail car. Every passenger train got two or three mail cars. Yeah. Count nothing but mail. Right. Nobody rides mail, but passengers is back behind. All the cars are behind. Next to the engine, they got two mail cars. In all the mail car, you got about two foot before you go in the mail. You stand standing door about two foot before you go up in the car. You can hide. You come in there and you go back up in, stand in the dark. You got to open the door to go in there, but you're about two foot before you get to the door. You got a good way to ride. Word would go out, often in newspapers, that they need workers for the wheat harvest on the Great Plains. Several years they called for 100,000. Well, that's just like a magnet then to people wanting a job. And the word comes that there's apple picking in Wenatchee, Washington, or Yakima, Washington. And then, of course, California, with all its variety of crops. And so the word goes out, and everyone heads there, and that's what the growers want. They want more workers than they need. And if they can't get them, then the news stories say acres of strawberries rotting on the ground, for example, or orchards rotting because they can't get workers. So these reports go, and uh, cherry picking in Michigan was another big one, or even potato digging in different areas. So agriculture certainly is the big pull, and the growers always want plenty of workers, and that's part of hobo life. They wanted workers when they needed them, and then when it was done, they wanted the hobos to get out of there. I played hob and guitar, right from the east south end, from Arkansas side back to the Alabama side. I know both sides. And then straight down, I know Mississippi, clean down the Louisiana line. I travel Kentucky some, but not too much. With Mississippi and Arkansas and Alabama, to Louisiana, Texas, I've been all over them states here about. All these freight trains were run by different companies. Mm. There are some statistics. I'll just read one. This is the Southern Pacific Railroad Company, one of the big companies. In 1930, this is the railroad company counted 170,000 trespasses. 
1930. In 1932, the number of trespassers had soared to 683,000. That's one line. So on most trains, you'd have somebody riding. Though Honey Boy's real dangers were from the railroad police, or bulls and hobo speak, being black didn't help. Though there was some solidarity within the hobo way, stories of racism come through. This is a man named Glenn Law. He discovered when he and his brother Walt left Wenatchee, Washington to go to Indiana in 1935. They rode in a boxcar with 20 whites and one black youth. The kid was about 18. It was dark and they heard a scream coming from the back of the car. Quote, it was the black boy crying for mercy, Glenn said. Walt and I were sitting in the boxcar door. We were too frightened to investigate what was happening. Screams mixed with coarse laughter went on hour after hour. Around dawn, the boy suddenly ran from the back of the car, pushed past us, and leapt from the moving train. We never knew if he lived or died, nor what indescribable horror he was fleeing. The prospect of work compelled hobos to travel great distances. But as many would testify, Honey Boy included, there's another driver too, a condition known as itchy feet or hot foot, a hunger for the road or the railway track, to head out to the unknown, to the horizon. George Dawson was a black man who left the South and hoboed for a number of years. He talked a little bit about the adventure of it, and he told at one point, but the thrill of getting on a train. He said, I didn't pay much attention to no one else. I just kept my eyes on the car and the handle I was getting ready to grab onto. I didn't want to go and lose my legs under those wheels. The moment when I was off the ground, one foot against the side of the moving train, one hand holding on to the train, or maybe an outstretched hand, that moment would last forever. There'd be an instant when I wasn't in the train, not on the ground. I can still feel it right now. There's nothing like it. The wind and the motion of the train want to pull you down and under the wheels. It takes everything you got to overcome all that and heave yourself into the car. Maybe someone will be there to help, maybe not. Either way, it was a mighty good feeling after I would get in, roll over, and then sit up. It was something special. If the train is not moving too fast, you can run along and jump up. You got a big doorway there. If you run about two or three miles out, just pull it over, you can run around and jump up in there. When I got around, I stood back in the dark. When everybody hooked up, I heard a train, woo, woo, get ready to go. I stepped in the back, in the blind there. When I get in the blind and I walk back, I'll be back there until I get to St. Louis. If you listen to Lead Belly's version of Midnight Special, actually recorded when he was serving time in Angola, you hear the prisoner lying in his bunk in the deep of the night and hearing an overnight train screaming down the tracks. Young come Mr. Rose, find the world do you know? Well, I know about a and it just I'm a railer on the show. As a midnight special passes the prison, light from the front of the train shines through the bars, and for an instant, the prisoners bathed in freedom. It's the closest he'll ever get to it, and for that brief moment, he's outside the walls and on that train, going far, far away. Shine your light on me, he pleads to the train. Shine your ever-loving light on me. Hoboing still runs deep in America today. The idea that money is going to get you everything is dismissed by these itinerant workers whose dreams lie on the horizon. Across this vast and varied country, there are hobos, young and old, who prefer to stay on the road rather than settle and try to find a nine-to-five job. And each year, since 1900, on the second weekend of August, the dusty town of Britt in the vast corn and wheat plains of Iowa becomes a center of a hobo gathering. Why here, you may ask? Well, 
It's where two train lines meet. I'm talking to wrong way. My dad was always on the road. He kept seven of us fed. Do you call yourself a hobo then? Yeah, I do. And, and what does that mean? Like, what's that mean to you? To me, it means freedom, freedom of choice. That's probably the biggest thing part of it, is the freedom of seeing different things in the world and the country, uh, seeing things that most people don't get a chance to see, working here and there, not doing a steady job, you know, working temporary. It's just pretty cool. I love it. I was standing across wrong. I know this sounds strange, <laughs> but you know, when you get the bug, some people call it the fever. Once you get it, you got it. And there's nothing going to cure itchy feet but moving. We help each other out, and when we're down or feeling bad, you can always talk to a hobo, whether you know him or not, because he knows what you're feeling. I'm going down. To me, that means a whole lot. I'm sorry to get a little teary eyed here. <laughs> We were talking just a little bit ago about the joy of the ride and how fast life goes by and then you grab a train and you're just out there in the freedom. Ricardo. And I like that big box car with both doors open. You got the biggest picture window in the world. You can go to either side and look out of it and, and enjoy the ride. We rode out to pick apples in Washington and we caught out in Minneapolis on the High Line and we were riding across Montana and all that. Went through Glacier and at five o'clock in the morning it had snowed. And we were in an open top gondola, but it was, so, I mean, it was cold, but it was beautiful. But we were standing up. We had our sleeping bags tucked underneath our chins, trying to keep all the body heat in. But we would be pointing, going, ooh, you know, and if somebody would see a bird flying, it'd be, look over here. And, you know, everybody was gathered in the front of the train. My big train, I hate to see her go. Redbird. My big train, I hate to see So why did you like it enough? It's a challenge to see America yeah. from places that the highways don't go. The railroads go along rivers and through canyons and the highways don't. The worst place to drive now is the interstate highways. You don't see nothing. But if you get on a train, look out a boxcar door, you see places that you can't see from the highways. I ain't got no ride, got no special here. There's only three types of travelers, okay? This word homeless, I don't care much for home. When they come out with the word homeless, it ruined a whole lot of stuff for a whole lot of people. So there's a hobo who travels for work and follows the creed to his best ability. And there's the tramp who travels and knows of the creed but don't follow it. And then there's the bum who does none of the above, does not even know about the creed. So what's the creed? The creed? Yeah. The kind of like guidelines to live by. I use one in particular a lot. When you go to a town and you can't find a job, make your own job. And that's how I get into making jewelry. There's a lot of other little things, you know, like keeping your camp clean. It's called boiling up. I uh, mean, you take a bath, being polite to people, because you never know who's coming in behind you, man. Don't put a bad taste in people's mouth, because there's going to be a hobo behind you, man, that needs help, okay? And if you abuse it, you just took it. I have no family, no nothing, so I think pretty much I decided the streets and the road was the only way I survived because of good people to help me out. One of the younger hobos here is known as Tan Man. I had nowhere to go, I had no father, I had no nothing, so I decided, hey, you know. I watched my mom die. My mom OD'd in a motel room from heroin, and um, that was tough. And that's when I knew I was always going to be a street kid. The streets were kind of cool because all the drunks, the prostitutes were like your family, right? So would you consider yourself like a modern version of the hobo? I do. The big thing about being a hobo, what I get out of it, of course, I don't care what the rest of them think. Are you willing to work? Do you pitch in? So, I was wondering, like, if hitchhiking is kind of the equivalent of what riding the rails would have been like in the 30s. That is very true, because, you know, it's funny, that's part of the wars we have. 
it's no different. You're hitching a ride whether you hop the damn train or whether you're hopping on, you know, right? The only difference is I'm a social tool. I can only sit on the train for so long and go, okay, this is boring. I can see all the scenery I want. I, I, I want to hang out with people. I love meeting every ride that I meet. I love meeting strangers that I've never met. Well, I'm just out here wandering Underneath the leisure sky And I'm gonna keep on wandering Lord, I'm gonna wander till the day I die I tried to talk to some of the younger hobos in their early 20s without much luck, but I did come across the shadow of a young rail rider known as Little Jay, who died riding the rails. You might find me by the side of the road or in that old train yard. Tina Wall recently published a book that tells his story. Little Jay was my son-in-law. My daughter Rosie had started traveling about a year before she met him. They were together for two years. They would travel and work. I'm gonna keep on wandering, Lord, I'm gonna wander till the day I die. It was October, and so they wanted to ride the West Coast Line south, and they were in a yard in Tacoma, Washington. It was late on a Saturday night, Sunday morning, and it was cold in the yard, and nothing had come through for hours and hours. It was like 1.30 in the morning when a train came through, and the only thing rideable was a suicide car. Officially called a container car. Usually they're 53 feet long, so if you see a truck or a train that has the number 53 on it, that's usually gonna be a suicide car. It's a flat bed, but instead of a bed, it's just rails. There's no floor. They're cross beams, sometimes they're straight, sometimes they're X's, and there's a little ledge along the side. And then at the front and back, there's a flat area called a porch. So you could sit on the porch, which is relatively safe, but deeper in the well, you'd be sitting on the ledge with your feet braced against this cross beam with the tracks going underneath your feet. Wandering around, just singing these country blues. So the train was moving as they were hopping on. There were three people, my daughter Rosie and her husband Jay and another girl. Apparently at some point during the night it got cold and so he was going into his backpack to get his sleeping bag out. They were on the porch. I don't know exactly, nobody knows exactly what happened, but apparently his sleeping bag went under the train and whatever happened, he slipped and he went under the train too. This is Railroad Man, a track that Jay recorded. According to Guy Davis, there's more than a casual bond between hip hop and early blues music. Call my last now need the railroad bridge. He's a fit before Poma was the only way to live. Spoke for revolutionary aspiration. Spoke past the 40 chan to the train station. Got to the station, the revolution in the eyes. I think in terms of the blues as being the ancestor of hip hop. Subject-wise, definitely, when you hear us back in the old days, they're talking about the high sheriff and, uh, you know, running with the corn whiskey. And now they're talking about the police and drugs. And both are talking about women, because us blues guys and rappers are certainly just great experts with women, or so we like to think. <laughs> I don't know what to make out of it. The blues is no longer the devil's music, as hip-hop now seems to be. The blues was guaranteed to get you straight into hell, but now it's this classical, beautiful, expressive music. There's a lot of musicians in this culture. Little Jay was a musician. Railroad Man was one of his most famous songs. One of his best friends, Dougie Fresh, is still playing music. I just ran into him in a park in New York a couple months ago, still playing. Nick Mazarakia, Burnout, all these guys, they play music, that's what they do. I think there's something to do with the musician's soul that can't go to a nine to five fluorescent cubicle, you know? They need to be out and play their music and it's their life. My 
tire on the van, try to bail me out the can. So there's a lot of musicians here. A lot of serious guitar pickers and banjo pickers and personally I don't know why a lot of them ain't in Nashville, you know, or cutting records, because there's some serious, serious musicians here. Honey Boy's two and a half decades with itchy feet and mistrust of white people meant he hardly got recorded till he settled down in Chicago. But he did have a reputation in the Deep South, and one song hunter eventually managed to catch up with him. This record of the Roman and Rambling Blues will be sung and played on the guitar by David Edwards, who lives near Oklahoma, Mississippi. He's a man who's been all over the country. He's a very experienced musician, same age as I am, 27 years old. And he's studied under the best guitar players in the country, and he really knows how. And he's going to show you in this record a lot of the different tricks that he's picked up on his travels. After constantly looking for and missing Honey Boy, Alan Lomax, famous for his field recordings of the early blues men, eventually found him in 1942. I was living in Oklahoma, 14 miles in Clarksdale, so Monday morning, a white man drove up in a big Hudson in this woman's yard, 1942 Hudson. You know how people out in the country, when you see a strange white man come up in a car like they're just scared, they don't know whether he is a sheriff or what he is or what he is, you know. Till this old lady, my auntie, she said, honey, she has a man out here in a big car, a white man. So he got a Washington license plate on it. I said, I was kind of scared, I didn't know. And then let this Mississippi woman make a nah nah. Plum fool out of me. And Mr. Slomax said, well, says, if I could find him, say, I just want him to do some recording for me. He said, that's all I want. I want to record him. So Miss Dealey come back. She said, this white man said he want to record you. So he wants you to make records. I said, yeah, tell him I'm in here. Oh, you got to roll just like a wagon wheel. So I put my clothes on, went out and talked to him. He said, I'm looking for you. Say, I want to record you. I don't know how he found out where I was, but he found me. And two by some other old musician, son, I was them, somebody. He carried me to Clarksdale, and we went to Clarksdale, a room on uh, 49 Highway at a tourist camp. He got him running. We eat at a restaurant. Then we went out in the country with tricks, and we started recording. Mr. Allen started recording, and uh, the middle of the session, he's coming up with a big storm that day. I mean, something like a tornado. Dark cloud got low, thunder and lightning, right in the middle of the session. So when it got quiet, we started back again. I think I'd done 17 cuts for him. I don't know whether it's Ray but I've done 17 oh, cuts for him. Ooh, I ain't got many more morning. Get about it lighter than mine. Each of the early blues men recorded by Lomax has their own distinctive sound, and Honey Boy had an ear for every one of them. Well, I'm gonna tell you, baby, no more tell you, low down. Dave Peabody. Bang it His method of operation was when he found a blues singer was that he asked them to recommend another one that they knew that would be worth recording and I think it was Honey Boy who recommended that he recorded McKinley Morganfield uh, aka Muddy Waters or it might have been the, the reverse way but they recorded both on the same trip Another blues guitarist who played with Honey Boy more recently is Paul Kay. Sometimes they'd sit together and play tunes at Honey Boy's apartment. Honey Boy would look at me, Paul, why don't you play a song for me? And I would, 99 times out of 100, I would play the Mississippi blues, the Willie Brown song that goes something like... Honey Boy did tell me once that he actually consciously created his style, which was really surprising. He looked at me once and said, oh yeah, at a certain age, he said, that's when I just made my own style. And I asked him, I said, you actually thought about it? And made, 
said, oh yeah, of course. Sort of like, doesn't everyone? You think it's so natural, it comes out of the soil, but no, these guys sit around and like Honey Boy, he said, I've been with Big Joe Williams and I've played with this one and that one. I can play Tommy Johnson stuff. When now it's time to play Honey Boy. The funny thing about this little encounter, I'm driving, I say, it's a Honey Boy. He said, you play it just like Willie Brown. Said, All right. Well, at the moment, I was a little worried about that, but then it occurred to me that that's really all I ever wanted to do with that tune anyway, so it kind of confirmed that I got it right. But the lesson that I was beginning to get from Honey Boy at that point was, don't sound like Willie Brown, don't sound like me. Honey Boy hoboed until the mid-50s when he moved to Chicago like his friend, musician and former hoboing partner Little Walter had done a few years beforehand, along with thousands of African Americans who found work in the factories and meatpacking plants here. This was the big city, with music of a different order. When Honey Boy first got here, would he have been looked down on maybe as being rather unsophisticated, like a, you know, a guy from a cotton patch or something like that? Or He and little Walter were very dear friends, and Walter was a sophisticated musician and a very brilliant musician, and I would say a musician of refined tastes, and he loved Honey Boy like a brother. I'm with Dave Witters. Baby, don't you want to go? Author of Chicago Blues, Portraits and Stories. There were certainly friendships across the styles. On the other hand, Honey Boy's sound, I think it's safe to say, probably retained a certain rawness. Sweet home, Chicago. And as the Chicago style grew in sophistication and complexity, more and more musicians of Honey Boy's generation, unless they kept up with it, might have been relegated to a more supporting role. To hear him tell it, he would play pop songs and hits by the likes of Louis Armstrong and others when he was playing the juke joint circuit down south when he was young. So if you take him at his word, in his prime, he had the chops and the adaptability to do just what I'm saying. It's possible that as he got older, like a lot of us, <laughs> he became a little set in his ways. Well, if I couldn't make no money playing music, I'd gamble. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, and I had dice, a pocket of dice, and all of it was bad. It wasn't down right. Honey Boy didn't just gamble with dice. He was like a magician with them and carried several hidden die. He'd load each one of them with mercury so they'd land exactly where he'd want them to and would switch them in and out of a regular pair with the swiftness and sleight of hand of a conjurer. A dangerous game for a hustler in hustler's circles. This is third dice. It's just the same size as the other two, the same thing. You can't tell it. Only got more dots. When I sat with Honey Boy in Chicago, his face would light up with memories of way, way back in time. Of his journeys riding boxcars and playing juke joints. Of women and booze. Hoboing the southern states, he got into serious fights. And all the time trying to stay ahead of the police and railroad bulls. <laughs> I had, to, I had to do that too, man. I, I had to do that. Honey Boy remained a hobo till the day he drew his last breath. I'm Gianluca Tramontana. Hoboing with Honey Boy was produced by Kate Bland, 